We're in week three of our series, One Another, and uh, I, I've been really uh, stirred afresh as I've been preparing and studying for this series of just how significant it seems that the purpose and the promise of God is to his people, not to his person. It's not just, you know, we, we live in a very individualistic society, which I'll mention more in a moment. And it's so easy for us when we read the scriptures to think about how th does this apply to me? But most of the scriptures, the correct question is, how does this apply to us? And this One Another series is a great way of exploring that. As I mentioned, we've been away at a conference this week. We've had a terrific time. And I think our social media team have been retweeting the links to the various talks that are all free to listen to. So please do have a listen. There's many. I wouldn't want to pick a highlight because there are so many good things that happened during this week. Some great teaching and some great inspirational preaching. So do, if you're looking for some good stuff to listen to, do check out those podcasts. Just check them out on our Facebook page and you'll get the links there. But I tell you what's been a real joy is reminding us that we're not, when we talk about one another, it's not just us here in this room. It's not even just us gathered in church buildings across this city today. It's not even just all of those gathered in church buildings across the country this day. But across the world, all over the world, there are millions and millions of people that we are connected one to another because we're part of God's kingdom. And I've just loved this week, standing with about 1,100 leaders, just lifting our hands in worship and just receiving from God and just knowing that these are our family. We're connected. We're joined together, part of the family of God. And it's weird. You can bump into somebody that you've never met before. And when they know Jesus, you just feel like you've discovered a new member of your family. There's something of a DNA that just sits in us that connects us to one another. That's just wonderful. And I, as well, just a few weeks ago, had the privilege of traveling to Chennai in India. And my purpose in going there was to meet with some pastors and some churches and to forge some links and to see if we can encourage them and they can encourage us and just to look and see where that develops in the future. But I was just blown away that I'm in the middle of a completely different culture. I, you know, I learned some new head moves when I was there. And uh, they were very graciously teaching me some stuff about their food and about their music. And it just felt like family. I was with a guy I'd never met before that's got this incredible story of God on his life. And I just felt like he was my brother. And yet we'd never met and we're going to keep in contact and keep in touch. I love that we're called to be part of a one another. That we're part of millions of people across the face of the earth. And this morning we're going to pick up a little bit more of looking at how this can have application into our lives. But you know, it's not just those around the globe or those around the church that are a part of this one another. There's an even wider context to the one another. And that is the context of history. So when this church has been serving in this city now for about 80 years or so, over its history, various names, various styles, but this church has been here, this building has been an Elam building since, um, so for about that period of time, I understand. And you know, there are people, when this building was first bought, that would have given up so much to buy this. They would have sacrificed so much to make it possible for us today. They would have prayed. In fact, I'm always stirred when I talk to Don, who's probably one of our longest standing members here. And he tells me of a time in the life of the church when the church was down to a handful of people. It couldn't afford to pay the heating bill within the building. And what we now have as our 24-7 prayer room was where the congregation were meeting on a Sunday downstairs because they couldn't afford to heat this place. And he tells me of the prayers they prayed that one day this would be seen. And they gave and they sacrificed and they loved and they prayerfully gave of themselves. And they handed a baton on. 
and the next generation took the baton. And now it's our turn. We've got the baton. And we, we, we haven't made this baton, we've inherited it. Because we're a part of a one another, of a team throughout history. In fact, there's a, a verse in Hebrews 12.1 that says this. Therefore, since we are surrounded, can we have it for the screen? Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles the race. And let us run the race, or run with perseverance, the race that's marked out for us. I love to picture that great cloud of witnesses. I believe that some of those cloud of witnesses are those who gave up their holidays and remortgaged their homes to buy this place. Some of the people who've prayed, and they're cheering us on, and they're watching the race, and they're seeing that they've handed the baton on, and we're running that race. And they're saying, come on, take off all those things that hinder you. Take off those rucksacks of sin that stop you running the race well. Come on, you can do it. And then we've got all of those around us in the lanes. We're not competitive. We've all got our own lanes, and we're running the same race. And we're running with that baton that the Lord has entrusted to us to be faithful with, to be full of passion and full of energy for, and we're running the race well, but we're a part of the one another. And I love that we're called to be a part of a team. There was a, a missionary that I heard speak this week who works in, um, I always forget what it's called, the new name for Burma. Yes, that place. Myanmar. Is that right? Is that correctly? Myanmar. Any other interpretations? No? <laughs> and um, he was telling us about just how the vast majority of that population will uh, not be Christian, will follow other religions, and that he travels from village to village and town to town with no invitation, with no contacts, and he will just go to talk about Jesus and someone will let them into his home and he will just boldly talk about Jesus and see people give their lives to him and they'll invite their neighbors. And he was telling a story that was not just the only time this has happened, just one illustration he gave of a moment he goes into a village to share about Jesus and some of the local officials there, they threaten his life. And he says to them, I'm already dead. It's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me. It would be my joy and my privilege if in the middle of preaching the gospel you were to take my life. Wow. That guy had a standard ovation at the end of it. Because that's the reality. He's one of our brothers. He's one of our team. We're standing hand to hand with him, running the same race. And we've got a lot to learn from him and others like him. A few years ago, I was running a big Christian event for young people and I hired in one of these shipping containers, these big metal boxes that put goods in and put them on ferries. And I hired one and brought it into the middle of the exhibition area. There's no windows. It's just complete blackness when you go inside. And we gave up young people the opportunity to be locked in there for five minutes. And we just about got away with it from a safeguarding perspective. <laughs> well, why were we locking them in there? Because... We've got brothers and sisters on the same team as us that are living in those environments through persecution. And we wanted our young people to understand some of the experiences of their team. That's the reality of the world we live in. There are many, many people persecuted for their faith around the world. And it's part of our team. This is our watch. And this missionary gave a quote that just impacted me so powerfully. And he says this. We've got it for the screen. There is no success without sacrifice. If you succeed without sacrifice, it is because someone has suffered before you. If you sacrifice without success, it is because someone will succeed after you. Some of the joy and the blessing that we have in the church today is because people have sacrificed. And there'll be things that we sow into this city today and into this community that others in future generations will reap. The Bible puts it like this, one sows, one reaps, but God gets the increase. And we're called to be part of this family. This is our watch, this is our time, this is our team, this is our baton. Let's run the race 
well. Romans 8, 19 says, creation eagerly awaits for the sons of God to be revealed. I believe there's a groaning and there's a, there's a desire deep entrenched into the world that we live for the reality of God's purposes to be revealed through the people of God. I believe all over the world, God is mobilizing his people right across the globe to rise up, to pay the price, to take the sacrifice, to run the race well with a baton in their hand, to build on that which previous generations have sown and to reveal God to this world. I believe with all my heart. It's not just um, motivational talk, you know, when I stand here and I say, I believe that God is going to win this city. I'm not wishfully thinking. I'm not just trying to be a person of faith. I believe it. I believe we can see this city. I believe we can see Devon resurrected with the life and the power of God. Do you know why I get my confidence on that? Well, first of all, I, I haven't come to it from a, an intellectual position because if you just look from an intellectual perspective, then there's a lot of negative that might distract from that conviction. But it is from a perspective that I believe with all of my heart that there's not one person in this city that God doesn't want to save. And so when I begin to align my life with the will and the purpose of God, I believe his will and his purpose is established because we agree with him. We agree that his will will be done. We can't say, Lord, not, not my will, but your will be done. And then God is saying, it's not my will, then he should perish. And then we live our life in unbelief that God's not going to do that. God's called us to align with his will and his purpose. And I believe with all my heart that we can see a great outpouring of the Spirit in the lives of this community, in the lives of many thousands of people, millions across Devon, I believe we can see it. But it isn't going to happen just by hoping. It'll happen because the people of God will become the one another that God has purposed us to be. And we are part of that response to creation eagerly awaiting for the sons of God to be revealed and so let's look at this together one of the backdrops to this series on one another is that this is very countercultural to the world that we live in today there's an annual survey that the governments carry out and they uh, one of the questions they ask is this how do you best improve the quality of life for everybody and they do this survey, they conduct it in society, they do a sample straw poll of, of communities and society, and they ask that question, how do you best improve the life for everybody? And they give them two options to answer. A, do you think that you best improve the quality of life for everybody by A, looking after the community's interests, or B, looking after your own interests? Up until the year 2000, the majority of people who answered that question answered A. We believe that we best improve the quality of life for everybody by looking after community interest. The year 2000, it changed. And it's changed every year since. Now people believe that we best improve the quality of life by looking after ourselves. We have become an individualistic driven, consumeristic driven society. Now let me get something clear. The Bible exhorts us and commands us to be good stewards of that which we have been entrusted with. So we can't deny personal responsibility. Uh, you can't deny that God loves you intimately and uniquely. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. So God is, you're not just part of a group. You are an individual that God loves. You are someone that he is entrusted and with stewardship of the things that you have within your life. But the problem is this, when we think that the gospel in our lives and the kingdom begins and ends there with our personal issues and our personal lives, actually the kingdom of God is far bigger than just our own needs. In fact, you know, the scripture encourages that golden rule that Jesus gave that do to others as you have them do to you. 
So in other words, we are to invest in the lives of other people as we'd like other people to invest in ours. Now we change that. We often um, think that um, actually I'm going to do to others as they've done to me. You know, so people have been mean-spirited with me. I'm going to be mean-spirited with other people. People have given me a hard time. They've not opened doors for me. I'm not going to open doors for them. And we reciprocate. And an individualistic society reciprocates that response that they've experienced in their life. But Jesus didn't say reciprocate. He said prophetically do to others as you would have them do to you. See, there's a big difference. Jesus came and he was full of compassion for people. Jesus didn't heal people because he thought this would be a great photograph in the Christian press. Jesus didn't um, love on people because he thought this would be great PR. Jesus did all these things because he was driven by compassion. You know, passion, we all know what passion is. Passion is a demonstrated excitement, conviction, determination. That's passion. Compassion, C-O-M, compassion. I always remember this as Christ, others, and myself with passion. And Jesus was full of compassion. Mobilized and motivated by the needs of others. In fact, we read he came to give his life for others. John 13, 34, Jesus talked about a new commandment. He said, a new commandment, I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. It's very easy to interpret the word love in a very soppy, romantic way. People at times past may have seen this verse and the response at the end would have been, let's all link hands and sing kumbaya my lord or let's hold hands link arms and sing bind us together lord bind us some of you are looking and saying you are so old <laughs> that's part of love but it's only part of it love is so tough it's rugged it's relevant gets involved in the dirt of our lives it's transformational it's completely revolutionary so when Jesus said love one another let's look at that revolution that he called us to there are three areas that I'm going to bring to us this morning of ways that we are called to love one another the first one is this a community of God's kingdom that love one another stirs up one another Love the scripture that says, fire into flame the gift of God that is within you. We should fan into flame the things of God in one another's lives. We're called to stir one another up. In fact, let me tell you what we're called to stir up in one another. We are called to stir up greatness. I want when people come into this community that they feel the impossible is more possible. That they sense that that destiny that they've had in the back of their mind is more likely to happen because they feel exhorted and built up and encouraged because God is working through his people to stir us up. There's greatness in you. And love stirs that up. Let me talk about some of the dynamics of community. Deuteronomy 32.30 it paints a really math a weird mathematical equation. It talks about one putting a thousand to flight. Now, if you're a mathematician, two should put two thousand to flight. But it doesn't say that. Two put ten, other versions say tens of thousands. There's a there's a catalytic power in community in God's equation. God, Jesus said, when two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in the midst. If you will agree on anything on earth, it will be done in heaven. There's a power of agreement if the only person you ever agree with is yourself. There's a weakness. You're called to come into alignment and agreement with God. And when we have a community where the people of God are in agreement with the will of God and the purpose of God, anything can happen. See, in that verse we just read, it talks about this couldn't have happened just by the natural hand of, God, uh, hand of man. This was God's intervention that caused a miraculous response. This was God 
involved in the equation. And throughout Scripture, God has been revealed, has manifested himself in spite of the circumstances because there comes an alignment in the community of God's people with the community of God's purpose in the heavenlies. And I believe with all my heart that you are called to greatness and that you need other people in order to fulfill that. Let me talk about isolation. Because isolation is not being in an empty room. This morning you could be sitting in this busy room, this warm room, this very warm room. And you can be feeling really isolated. Because isolation is not about proximity to other people. Isolation is about having a wall around your life that prevents people coming close. And isolation, we never lived in a more isolated society than we have today. We've got more communication methods than we've ever had, but people have never felt so alone. Isolation is destructive and dangerous. Isolation makes you, if you're an isolated believer, you are the easiest person for the enemy to pick off. If he's looking around the room and thinking, who am I going to get? The isolated ones. Your prime candidates. In fact, you might as well wear a target on your backside. Because you're exposed. I've never been in a war. But I do know if someone gets split up from their, from their regiment, they're the easiest for the enemy to get. See, being part of the kingdom of God's people is not about going to church. It's not about having services. It's about connection to the kingdom of God in one another that releases the greatness of God in one another. And if we're not, then we're just existing and very likely to get picked off. That's why we emphasize life groups. It's, it's one of the reciprocal benefits of getting involved in one of our ministries, you know. Because particularly, if I can stereotype, guys, some of us are not very good at making friends, are we? Some of the wives are nudging them right now. In fact, the truth is that most of the good friends that guys have, our wives introduce us to them. Because they're the husband of their friend. happens so much so guys to be connected you probably got to do something with others to get involved now it's great that you're doing something but that's not just the only purpose the purpose is to connect so that you're not isolated so that greatness can be brought out of you if you're isolated you're easy pickings and you might be isolated because you feel that you've been hurt by others in the past. You may feel inadequate. And in response to that, it's just easier and less painful to stay separate. God's got a bigger vision for you than that. Jesus wants to heal that rejection of your life. He wants to speak greatness into you that says that inadequacy you carry is not his doing. Don't live in isolation. Come into one another community. Jesus instructed his disciples to go two by two into society, to go in pairs. And here the reality is most of you work in environments or go to school or college in environments, university, where you're the only Christian maybe in your class or in your workplace. I almost think it'd be quite handy at times to when you go for a job interview, they call your name and you come in and you bring your friend and you sit down and say, the two of us want to apply for this. So we, we want to follow Jesus, but we want to follow him really well. So we realize the two of us will make this easier for us to live our faith. Because, do you know, you're not... Society will tell you that your faith is a private matter. It's not. No, it's not. That's not what the Bible says. You're not meant to be isolated and live your faith in private. How can you make it private? How can something that's so transformed your life? Now, it's relevant and it's intimate and it's, and it's 
you know, has an impact on you and on one another people. But can you imagine if different places I went, I, you know, I'm married, I love Nita, but I'm not going to tell anybody about it. It's a private matter. What? I'm going to shout from the rooftops. Have you seen her? It's amazing. I want people to know. This is my wife. Jesus in your life. What, what are you doing? Private. Stop listening to the narrative of society. This is not a private faith. This is a public faith. This is not to be hidden. This is to be revealed and exposed. All of your workplace, they wait for the sons of God to be revealed. They groan in for answers in life. And unless you go public, they're not going to find that out. You see, you might be you know, pleased and impressed that you're in a church where the pastor believes we're going to see the city give their life to Jesus. But please don't just applaud and say that's great. Believe it for your area. Believe it for your community. I can't come to your workplace and lead them to Jesus, but you can. I can't sit on the next desk to your work colleague, but you can. I can't live in your house and speak to your neighbors, but you can. If you're going to join in in unison and say, yes, we believe we can see the Lord reach and touch the life of this city, then at least believe it for your community, for your neighborhood, for your workplace. God's called us as employees to be the best employees. You should stand out in your workplace as being the best because you're motivated by doing it for Jesus. His motivation, he, he is our whole purpose. If you're a boss, if you run a company, you should be the best boss because Jesus is your motivation. It's not so you can work your way up the ladder in your company so that you can shine with Jesus. It's not so that you can have a profitable business. It's so that you can shine with Jesus. All of creation's groaning for the sons of God to be revealed. But a lot of the time we spend it on our own. Can I just give you some practical advice? In your company, it doesn't matter what church they come from. If there are other Christians, why don't you connect with them? Why don't you arrange to meet them for a coffee? Why don't you say, hey, listen, um, I know we go to different churches. We might sing different sorts of songs, but we both love Jesus. Why don't we just get together and pray for our company? Find ways of creating alignment in your life. Mothers in school, taking the kids to school gates. Find alignment with other Christians. Doesn't matter what church they go to. They're part of your family. They're part of the team. They're part of one another. Find alignment because you'll be more encouraged when you find those alignments. Secondly, so we firstly stir up a loving community, stirs one another. Secondly, a loving community sharpens one another. Nita does an amazing roast dinner. Particularly at Christmas, it is just like every chef that produces this Christmas recipe, it, I think she tries them all and we just have it all piled up. In fact, we almost can't sit at the table because there's just too much beautiful Christmas experimentation taking place. But then the turkey comes out. And there's a few jobs that us guys have. The bins and carving the meat. Occasionally we trusted with cooking if it involves a barbecue. Basically, we're allowed to burn stuff. <laughs> so the turkey comes out and it's all been roasted and basted beautifully. All this other stuff sits around and it smells amazing. And then you pull the carving out, uh, knife out of the kitchen drawer and you, but it's blunt. And rather than those nice slices sitting on the plate next to that beautifully cooked veg, you've got chunks. Just, in fact, you know, I'm, I'm going to get the saw out of the garage. I think, arr, arr, just, but it's just, it spoils the aesthetic appearance of the meal. It tastes the same, of course. You know, when I've noticed that when I try to do something with a blunt edge, it never works properly. You need to have a sharp edge, and you might have had a sharp edge at some point in your Christian life in an area, but you may have gone blunt. And the community of God's people is meant to sharpen one another up. 
We're meant to be like a, a knife sharpener. That when we interact, we make each other sharp. That's God's plan for his community. When we meet with a knife and the sharpener, sparks should fly in the house of God. All too often through Christian history, sparks have flown in the body of Christ, but they've been for the wrong reason. It's because we're clashing rather than sharpening. And God wants us to sharpen each other. Like flint sharpening flint. Proverbs 27, 17. It says this, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. The community of God's people, kingdom people, we're not supposed to just hold hands, sing songs, have nice services, and then go away and have a nice jolly week until the next time. We're meant to bring sharpness out of each other. To make sure our cutting edge is aligned with the purpose and the will of God over our life. That's what the community of God's people is about. But I've discovered over the years that I only sharpen knives if I understand that they can and should be sharp. Let me explain this further for you. I believe how we see one another determines how we respond to one another. So if the person next to you, if you just think they're a problem, your response will be to avoid them. Now this is hypothetical. I know no one in the room will have any understanding what I'm talking about. Certainly you're pretending very well that you don't have a clear what I'm talking about. How you see people determines how you respond to them. Let me give you an illustration. A number of years ago, I was running a youth group. And on our very first night of opening the doors of this community center in a really needy housing estate, it was a, a wet night. And there was a line of young people waiting outside this community center for us to open the doors for the first time to a youth club. While the team continued to prepare, I went out to meet these young people that were waiting in the cold and wet winter's night. One of the first pe person I met was a young guy, 15 years of age, that was obviously the gang leader. The others looked to him. He seemed to have influence. He was cool. He had street cred. He seemed to have all the right designer gear. And he just looked like someone that was influential. 15 years of age. And he was loud. And he was bolshy. And when I saw him, I saw the hand of God on his life and thought, God has purposed you to be a great leader. I never shared that with him, but it affected how I responded to him. A few months later, after this club had been running for some time, I was away on travels, ministering elsewhere, and when I came back after a few weeks away, my team began to fill me in on the activities of the previous few weeks, and they said, that this young guy, because of his behavior, had been asked to leave each of the previous two weeks. When they explained what his behavior had been, I congratulated them on doing the appropriate thing because we had to keep the standards right within the group. The following week, I go to the youth club and in walks this guy. And he said to me, I suppose you've heard about the last few weeks of you. I said, I have. I said, can I have a chat with you a moment? So I took him to the corner of the room and I said, very first time I met you, don't know if you remember it, outside on that cold, wet night, I saw God's hand on your life to be a great leader. And I said, I'd like to invite you to become a junior leader in the youth club. He said, I was banned for two weeks <laughs> for my behavior. I said, I know. I said, and you deserve that. And they were right to do that. But I said, what's happened in your life is that you've got a call and a gift on you to lead people and you're using it for the wrong reasons. If you turn that around and we can help you do that, then you can find a purpose in your life that will actually use that gift to transform the lives of other people positively. Would you like it? 
said, do you really think I could do that? I said, I believe you can. You see, my perception changed my behavior. My perspective changed the way I related to him. You know, at the end of the night, you're not going to believe this. He came up to me at the end of the night after being really great all night. He said, where's the vacuum cleaner? Can I hoover? I said, does your mum know you know how to use one of those things? He said, no, don't tell her. (laughs) What took a young person from being banned for two weeks to put in the hoover round? It was perspective of someone else. When When I look around this room, some of you think you're nobodies. Some of you think you've blown it. Some of you think you can never achieve greatness in your life. And I look around this room, and I don't believe you're coming to join a congregation. I believe you're coming to join a team. And I look at you, and I, I want to see the vision of God for your life. Because I see greatness over you. Some of you think, oh, I'm just, I've done too much. I've blown too many, I've done too many mistakes. I've just messed up. I, I'm not as talented as other people. And I, do you know how we see one another determines how we relate? And some of you, it's true for your own life. How you see your own life determines some of you are taking a back seat in your faith because you don't believe you can achieve anything for God. And God wants you to know the truth that ever since you were knitted together in your mother's womb, He knew you. That He knows the plans He has for you, plans to give you a hope and a future, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. And if you will get a hold of the promise of God over your life, you can step forward and say yes to the baton. I'm going to run this race well, and I am going to be the man or the woman of God that you've purposed me to be. I'm not going to wait till another point in my life. I'm not going to wait till I'm too old and then say I missed it. I'm not going to wait till a moment when my gifting feels like it comes in into alignment now is the time I'm going to run the race well and the responsibility we have as God's people is to look around the room to look around the team and see greatness in each other because unless you see it you just treat people as ordinary and the community of God's people we're called to be a people that sharpen one another sharpen destiny I wish I had more time to go on this I'm going to go one more point of this described in John 1 that Jesus came full of grace and truth how does this relate since I've come here there have been a number of occasions where I've I'm going to use a strong word It's an accurate word, but it's a strong word. There have been times I've been involved in disciplining some people. Can I just unpack that a little bit for you? Because I've never disciplined anybody out of a sense of retribution or out of a sense of punitive measure. Because that's not what we as parents do. We don't say, you spilled that on the carpet, therefore I'm going to punish you. That's That's not what discipline is about. Discipline is about helping people come in alignment with the greatness that's in them. You know, I, I'm not a naturally confrontational person, okay? So it's not, it's not something I relish doing. But I, I don't have any hesitation in sitting down with anybody and exploring honestly some of the issues in their life. Let me tell you why. Because I believe that what I'm trying to do is to bring greatness out of them. You know, there have been times I've sat down with people and said, When I look in your life, I see that God has got great things in store for you. But right now, you're missing it. And there are things that you're engaged in and involved in that are keeping you away from that destiny. And I want to help you to be free from those things. Because God's word says you can be. You should be. Sometimes... We take one of these extremes and we say, oh, we're a community of grace. Let's just leave it. Let's just let us all play around. Just, let's be just tame. Let's all just smile. Let's all just carry on, just worship and 
lift our hands some weeks, I'll lift them some weeks I won't, but let's just, let's just do nice things. Let's be a, a loving community. I believe grace has teeth. And then I got other communities I've seen over the years, they say, we're about the truth. And they condemn people. And they just speak it without any love in their hearts. You know, I've had people come up to me over the years and say, Mark, I just want you to know I forgive you. I'm speaking the truth in love. I forgive you. I'm thinking, I didn't even know I'd hurt them. They're not sharing that because they're trying to be full of grace and truth. They're sharing that uh, because I'm being a therapy session for them right now. Deal with it yourself. Now, the Bible says confess your sins one to another. But I always go to someone and say, you know, I've had an issue with you over the years and I'm really sorry, and, but I forgive you. What's all that about? You see, being a community of grace and truth means that we are stepping out in those things because it's the best for the other person. That's what compassion does. I don't want to be, I make a promise to the team here that I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with them. And you ask any of the team, they, I think I'm consistent with it. And so if I walk in one day and I'm, you know, I'm maybe had a bit of a, you know, I'm just feeling a little bit low. I get those days sometimes, do you? Okay, it's two of us. You know, when I, um, and if I don't have that honest culture, people think, oh, have I, have I offended? Mark, have I done something wrong? And, and I say, if, I, if you have, I'll, I'll talk to you. I'll do it nicely, I hope. I'll try with love to do it. But I tell you what really should be the ultimate aim is that we've got a prophetic vision for their life that we're speaking into and we want to release them into their destiny. It's not to get things off your chest. This is, not a, this is not a Jim Carrey moment of that. Have you seen that film, Liar, Liar, where he's just compulsed to tell the truth? That causes devastation. That's not, that's not what speaking the truth in love is. Speaking the truth in love is that you love this person so much, you believe the best for them, and you don't want that thing to rob them. It's not about you, how you feel about it. It's about their destiny. We're designed to make each other sharp. And finally, we're designed to share. You're unique, you know. Your journey is unique. Your gifting is unique. Your experiences are unique. And you might resent that uniqueness at times. You might look at someone else's lane that they're running their race in and think, if only I had their shoes, if only I had their experiences, if only I didn't have the hurdles that I've got, they seem to have it clearer than I do. I want you to know that if God's called you to the race, he's called you to the race for a purpose. And your lane is your lane for a purpose. And the lane that you're running in, if you spend your time looking at other people's lanes and thinking, I wish I had theirs, you will not run your race correctly. Because runners, they don't spend their time, you know, Hussein Bolt is not, he's not got wing mirrors on, is he? He's not thinking, oh, what's happening in the next lane? What's going on with them? He's running his race. And you should run your race with passion, with desire, Finish with a story. When I was in Chennai the other week, part, one of the pastors I was connecting with, he said, have you ever had a dark room experience? I said, what, like photography? He said, no, no, no. He said, rather than explain it to you, I'll take you. So he took me to this place, like a tourist place. And uh, I had to take everything off that illuminated, like phones and watches and put it in a locker. And then they opened the door, gave us a white stick, and then closed the door, just the two of us, and then we are stood in the middle of complete blackness. I mean, I put my hand in front of my face. I couldn't see my fingers move. I couldn't see anything. I have never been in such a dark, dark experience. They give us no instructions. So I'm there with this white stick trying to get a sense of perspective. And I can feel I'm in some sort of corridor. And the other pastor behind me, I can feel him banging the stick on the wall and catching my ankles a little bit as well. And we're in darkness, we're in a corridor. What do we do now? And then this voice in the distance says, please follow me. 
So we hadn't met this person, didn't know who they were. So it seemed to make sense. So I began to feel my way up this corridor that was weaving and winding towards the voice. Got towards this voice. He says, please, please, out your left hand. I put my left hand. He put something in there. He said, can you feel what it is? And the whole experience is designed to take away one of your senses so it heightens the other senses. Fascinating. There was a rickety old wooden bridge. I think it was wooden. I think it was rickety. But we couldn't see anything, but we just walked across here and it just felt scary without seeing. Another time he said, what can you feel in front of you? And it was a net. He said, what sort of net? Fishing net? No. Cricket net? Yes. Opened the cricket net, went inside. He said, I'm going to lead you towards a bat. I'm going to bowl a ball with a rattle in it, see if you can hit the ball. And I was amazed. This guy, this guide, seemed to find this ball wherever it was so quickly. And I said to him, how are you seeing your way around? I've not heard you with a stick. I've not heard you bang into a wall. Have you got infrared goggles on? How are you seeing your way around? He said, please, sir, just hold that question. I'll explain at the end. We did a few more experiences. There's a restaurant in the middle where you can have a three-course meal in complete darkness. That is a literal blind date. <laughs> taste some things. And I say, how are you seeing? Please answer the question. I can't get the question out of my head. How are you finding your way around? He said, please, I'll explain at the end. Well, we get to the end after about 30 minutes. And he said, you've been really keen to find out how I'm finding my way around. And I'm going to tell you. He said, sir, I'm completely blind. I was born blind. I've never seen. He said, welcome to my world. Man. For half an hour, I experienced what it was like to be blind. And I'm thinking, this is incredible. But you see... His race enabled me at that moment to be guided around. You know, there are weaknesses and challenges and difficulties you've experienced. And they're not just to test you. they so you can lead other people. So you can bear with one another, as it says in Romans 15, bear with one another's weaknesses. In conclusion... The stewards are going to pass around some baskets. In the baskets are pieces of a jigsaw. It's a thousand piece jigsaw. You can take two pieces each. The jigsaw, when it's complete, is this picture from the Cathedral Green. You can see the Clarence Hotel just to the left. It's burned down now. What I like about jigsaws, and I don't, I don't really do them, but what I like about the illustration is that they're all 